Hey everyone, welcome. Thanks for clicking on the video. What I'm going to do today is talk about a lot of important concepts that you need to keep in mind with regards to a lumbar puncture. We're going to talk about some of the pertinent anatomy and actually do a demonstration on a simulation mannequin. We're going to get started right now. Hey, don't forget to hit subscribe and turn on notifications. All right, so what we're going to cover today, I'm gonna to talk about some of the common indications, the reasons that you might get a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap as it's sometimes called on a patient. We're gonna talk about some of the important contraindications, the reasons that you might not get or shouldn't get a lumbar puncture on a patient. We're going to open a lumbar puncture tray and I'm going to show you what's contained in a standard normal lumbar puncture tray and then we're going to talk about some of the pertinent anatomy that's associated with this procedure that you need to keep in mind. We'll use a skeleton model to do that and then we'll talk about actually performing the LP and I'll, I'll demonstrate on a simulation mannequin. So first of all let's talk about some common indications or reasons you might perform a lumbar puncture on your patient. Now uh, more Often than not, lumbar punctures are performed in the emergency room setting. Sometimes neurologists perform lumbar punctures in the outpatient clinic, and sometimes they're performed in the hospital, maybe in the ICU or other places within the hospital and on the med surge floor. So one of these common indications is suspicion of meningitis. If we are suspicious that our patient might have this central nervous system infection and infection or inflammation of the meninges, a lumbar puncture would be indicated and can show characteristic signs within the cerebral spinal fluid. Another pretty common indication, especially in an emergency room setting, is to confirm negative on a subarachnoid hemorrhage or reveal positive. The most the most important initial diagnostic study of choice in a suspected aneurysm rupture of like a berry aneurysm is a CT of a head without contrast. So CT head without contrast most of the time is going to reveal acute blood uh, in, a, in a pattern that is consistent with a ruptured aneurysm. Now if the CT head without contrast is initially interpreted to be negative for evidence of a subarachnoid hemorrhage with an aneurysm rupture, um, most of the time we're going to confirm negative by performing a lumbar puncture and evaluating for any evidence of red blood cells or bleeding into the CSF. Okay, so those are our two most common, especially in emergency room settings, uh, indication for a lumbar puncture, for suspicion of meningitis and for suspicion of aneurysm sub aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage in the presence of a normal CT. Um, some other common reasons that a, a lumbar puncture may be performed um, would be for suspicion of other neurologic conditions, especially demyelinating ones. So multiple sclerosis and Guillain-Barre syndrome are the two most common in that category. Uh, both of these Cre uh, both of these result in demyelination or death of the, the myelin sheath, and these can produce abnormal findings like elevated protein on CSF. Another reason we might order uh, or perform a lumbar puncture on a patient is for the therapeutic relief of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So when someone has elevated level, uh, elevated intracranial pressure, for reasons we don't fully understand, but it's a chronic condition, uh, we might perform a lumbar puncture and drain an awful lot of that CSF for therapeutic reasons. So we should also talk about the contraindications, the important reasons that you maybe shouldn't get the lumbar puncture or that it would be dangerous to perform a lumbar puncture. One of the most well-known contraindications is a central nervous system lesion that can cause increased intracranial pressure and specifically the kind of intracranial pressure that is creates unequal amounts of pressure across different parts of the head. So remember down the middle of the head we have the falx cerebri that's between the right and the left, he left hemispheres and then we have the tentorium cerebelli that lies be above the cerebellum between the cerebellum and the temporal lobes laterally and the occipital lobes uh, posteriorly. And so if we have anything that causes increased pressure on the right or the left or increased pressure in the supra tentorial area compared to the infratentorial level area, uh, then 
when we perform the lumbar puncture and remove some of that pressure below, down in the lumbar area, because it's all continuous, uh, that puts the patient at increased risk of brain herniation because that release of pressure below can cause the brain to shift and herniate if there's increased pressure on one side versus left side versus the right or above the tentorium and below the tentorium. It can cause the brain to herniate under the falcs or herniate under the tentorium or even cause the brain stem to shove down into the foramen magnum. And all of these are very dangerous and frankly, uh, incompatible with life most of the time. And so that's a dangerous situation. We need to know that there's no mass effect, midline shift, anything that's causing any abnormal loss of cerebrospinal cisterns on a head CT, uh, posterior fossa masses would be a concern, spinal column masses would be a concern, uh, large brain abscess, large brain tumors. These are all things that can cause these unequal pressures between the different regions of the cranium, and that puts an increase risk for brain herniation during the lumbar puncture. So it's probably the most significant and most important one to remember and that's why a head CT is most often performed before a lumbar puncture in a, a lot of situations, especially if there's focal neurologic deficit. Now another important uh, contraindication is if there's any skin infection around the site where the lumbar puncture is going to be performed. So if there's any degree of cellulitis in the area or any abscess in the lumbar area, we should not perform a lumbar puncture there because it opens up the risk of a possible central nervous system infection, tracking that infectious pathogen down into the central nervous system, which the fecal sac down in the lumbar area is part of the central nervous system and continuous with the brain through the CS. Another important contraindication is any traumatic injury to the lumbar spinal column, okay? And that can be acute trauma, trauma that's happened there in the lumbar spinal area uh, right now, the patient has that injury now, or possibly uh, in the past and there's either been some type of a reconstructive surgery or there's a lot of scar tissue in the area that would make the procedure much more complicated. Now the rest of these contraindications are pretty similar and they're considered kind of relative contraindications because sometimes if we really need to perform the lumbar puncture we can correct some of these abnormalities before we do this. So they can all be kind of categorized into this idea of a coagulopathy. So specifically coagulopathy disorder, so hemophilia, von Wildebrandt disease, uh, bleeding disorders due to hepatic failure, these kinds of things that cause abnormal bleeding as, as a result of the condition. That would be a contraindication to a lumbar puncture because it would put the person at increased risk of bleeding and specifically a kind of bleeding in the spinal column like, a, like an epidural hematoma that can compress neural tissue and, and be massively problematic. Uh, similarly, a platelet count under 20,000. So if the platelet count is less than 20,000, that's considered an absolute contraindication. Ideally, we like to see the platelet count be above 50,000. Um, so if it's, if it's 50,000 or above, you're generally believed to be safe to perform the, the procedure. But if it's less than 50, worry about it. If it's less than 20, you really shouldn't be performing that lumbar puncture. Another one is if the patient has received heparin, whether it's unfractionated heparin or low, mo low molecular weight heparin within the past 24 hours, that would also be considered a contraindication. Now, all of these last three uh, components are things that cause an abnormality on the labs most of the time. And so we would see like an elevated INR, uh, INR normally is around 1.0. If it's above 1.5, that would be a relative contraindication to a lumbar puncture. We should also check PT and PTT. And so with the, along with PTT, PT, INR, and the platelet count, that's kind of our coagulation panel. Now, if any of these abnormalities are present, then it would be recommended for us to correct these abnormalities before performing a lumbar puncture. And that can be done depending on the situation. It can be done with administration of donor platelets or possibly some fresh frozen plasma to replenish uh, coagulation factors. Just depends on the situation. But these are some of the most important contraindications that you want to keep in mind when considering performing a lumbar puncture on your patient. All right, so now let's go through the contents of a standard lumbar puncture tray. So in, in an emergency room setting or different places in the hospital where a lumbar puncture might be performed, these lumbar puncture trays are generally available. It's a sterile package, so the contents of the package 
are sterile and you don't want to open it unless you're ready to be handling sterile sterile uh, materials okay so uh, this happens to be an adult uh, or a regular lumbar puncture tray it's got a 20 gauge three and a half inch spinal needle 20 gauge is the more common size to be using uh, especially with adult patients uh, the list of contents is always on the outside as well so that you can look through that and make sure you've got everything you need generally a lumbar puncture tray does not come with sterile gloves so you want to make sure you get sterile gloves in your size ready uh, before you open anything as well um, and it may or may not contain the probodyne iodine solution that you need, so make sure you look for that there. Now, uh, there are pediatric or infant lumbar trunk puncture trays out there as well that just have a little bit different with size of needles and things. But let's go ahead and open this up. So again, you want to, you're going to open this in a sterile fashion, meaning careful not to contaminate anything. So you're going to peel this back, making sure that you're opening it in an area where it's okay to have a sterile, something sterile, creating a sterile field with the contents okay and you're going to open the the paper wrapping in a sterile way as well where you're only touching on the very edges and corners uh, instead of anything in the middle so I'm going to just be careful to not touch uh, any of the contents and generally you can use the paper to kind of get the the last part to open up here careful not to touch anything and pull that across okay so everything that's contained within this is now sterile is is sterile and you don't want to contaminate it or touch it unless you yourself have sterile gloves on so once you're ready at that point and you're wearing sterile gloves you can go ahead and touch and handle these okay so uh this comes with a fenestrated drape i'll demonstrate a fenestrated drape a little bit later on so that's the one that goes on the patient and usually comes with a little bit of a sterile towel as well that you can place there uh near the patient's back also other things, this one does not come with a providine iodine solution, so you would want to have someone, usually an assistant of some, like whether that's an ED tech, an, a nurse, another provider, whoever it might be, usually while you're wearing sterile gloves, they can open the providine iodine solution and carefully, without touching anything, empty that in a sterile way into the little trough that's here for your, your uh, solution. Okay, so then you'll use these sponges. It usually comes with three, and depending on the manufacturer, they'll they'll look a little different, but three of these sponges, um, and I'll demonstrate this a little bit later on again, but you're going to use that trough to soak up the solution into the sponge. You can use this little area to tamp it off a little bit so you're not dripping everywhere, and then you're going to go sterilize uh, the patient using all three of these. And once you've touched the patient with this, you cannot put it back in your sterile field. That goes in the ground, set it off somewhere without contaminating yourself. Okay, does not go back on the tray though. Now some other things uh, that are contained here, let's talk about the, uh, the tubes first. So there are four tubes as you can see. Now these tubes on the side, I think it might be a little hard to see in the video here, uh, but they're labeled one, two, and up CCs. Okay, so one CC, 2cc and generally we're going to fill these tubes not all the way full we're going to fill them to a, between one and two cc i usually just just more than one cc if you're going to be ordering a lot of special tests then on your tube for special tests which is usually number three in most situations you might make sure you fill it a little higher like two cc's but usually between one and two cc's now on the back um, or somewhere else on the tube, again, depending on the manufacturer, it'll be a number. I don't know if you can see it very well in the video, but this one's labeled number one, okay? So they're all labeled one through four, and you're going to fill them in that order as well. So uh, what I generally do is I'm getting set up here. I wanna open these up so that they're ready, and notice you can sit them in a little bit of a, a rest there. So I'm gonna open all four of them up and have them sitting open like that so that while, after I've got the needle in place and I've got CSF flowing, I can easily just grab those tubes in order one through four. Now, usually tube one is for cell counts, Tube two is for protein and glucose. Uh, tube three is generally for special tests. Uh, tube four is generally used for gram stain and culture um, and can be used for repeat uh, cell counts if, if uh, maybe the, the, there was any worry of maybe a potentially traumatic tap. A traumatic tap is when the needle, is, when your first tube while you're filling it up, you're seeing blood, but as you go through tube one, two, three, four, you see that it seems to be clearing up, which generally means your needle probably passed through some of the epidural veins and you're getting a little bit of blood from not within the CSF, but from the soft tissue around the dura. 
Um, and so if, if a traumatic tap is believed to possibly be the reason for any blood, then you can repeat cell count on, on, on uh, vial number four. But uh, that, that there's no law or general rules that those are the, the tests that are performed on the different uh, tubes or vials, but that's generally most common. Um, it kind of depends on the lab at the facility where you're at, but usually it's cell count, protein and glucose, special tests, gram scene and culture, and maybe repeating cell counts. All right, so those are the vials. Um, let's go through some other things here. We've got uh, lidocaine. So uh, each kit is usually going to contain a little bit of lidocaine, oftentimes in a little glass vial like this, with the little hourglass type. And so you can tap it to make sure all the lidocaine goes down below that thin little neck there. Um, but what you're going to do to open this up when you're ready for it is you want to firmly grab onto the bottom. And again, we're, we're wearing sterile gloves in this case, right? So you'd be firmly hold onto the bottom of the tube. And then with your other hand, firmly hold onto the top and the very the the thin little neck is actually uh there's a little groove that's been cut into it so that it generally breaks pretty cleanly but you're going to firmly hold onto both pieces and just crack it off okay don't get wild with this and make sure you're being careful but crack the top off and that's going to open it up and then that's a because it's glass you would consider this a sharp so be careful with it okay and then once you've got that opened you can sit it in that little stand that's uh, available as well so that you can draw up uh, your lidocaine. So speaking of drawing up lidocaine, your uh, kits usually are going to come with a three, three, uh, excuse me, a three cc syringe uh, and generally two different needles. One needle will generally be a filter type needle for actually aspirating and drawing up your lidocaine filter type needle to ask uh, to block anything like tiny little glass shards or things that could have been within the lidocaine. All right, so that's a filter needle to be able to draw that up. And then generally you're going to be using something like a 25 or a 27 gauge, generally a 25 gauge needle uh, to be injecting lidocaine into the patient's back in the area where you will be passing your spinal needle. All right, so that's your, and I, I generally will inject about two, two and a half, three cc's of lidocaine in the area. Um, so especially on an adult. Um, you've got a sterile piece of gauze that's generally uh, contained within the lumbar puncture tray as well so that if there's any bleeding at the site uh, after you've injected lidocaine, you can use that to clean up any blood uh, before you then use your spinal needle. So here's our spinal needle. I'll talk more about the characteristics of the spinal uh, needle elsewhere in this video, but um, it's got a cover over the top so you can pull that, that cover off there. Um, and the spinal needle, this one happens to be a little bent because it's been used before on a simulation mannequin and must have been bent at the time. Uh, but uh, the bevel of the needle is covered up. If I can, I don't know how well you'll be able to see this in the video, but I'll try to show it a little clearly, a little more clear later on or at a different part of the video. But the bevel of the needle is covered or occluded by the stylet. And so there's a stylet that's also within the, the spinal needle that you can then pull out and then insert again as you're moving the spinal needle. So anytime you are pushing the spinal needle in or withdrawing the needle, the stylet needs to be fully inserted. Okay, and that's going to reduce the amount of trauma that's being caused by this needle to the tissue. This is some pretty uh, important tissue, especially the dura itself, uh, and we want to minimize the amount of trauma and damage that we create to hopefully reduce the incidence of complications. So that's the spinal needle. I'll talk more about that a little bit later on in the video. Now, um, let's see, what else should we talk about here? The manometer. Okay, so the manometer... Uh, are these tubes here. The manometer is used to measure opening pressure. In really almost every situation, there are very few situations where you don't really need to measure opening pressure, but make sure you are measuring opening pressure. Oftentimes I see lumbar punctures being performed and the manometer was never used, and it, the lumbar puncture was being performed for a reason that knowing the opening pressure would have been a bit of vital information for that patient's condition. So make sure you actually do use the manometer, okay? It's measured in centimeters of water, generally. So these are centimeter markings um, up the side. The second piece here is an extension piece that continues the count. It goes from 36 and then 39 into 40 there. Um, this The upper part here is nice because you can have maybe an assistant in the room that's helping you hold the top of that while you're actually measuring opening pressure to free up your right and left hand. Just be mindful of uh, not contaminating the sterility of the procedure. 
So you're going to get this set up, uh, put the extension piece on there, keeping everything sterile. And there's also another piece here called the stopcock. Okay, the stopcock. And we're going to connect the stopcock to the bottom part of the manometer. All right. So stopcock goes onto the manometer, and uh, the stopcock is, uh, uh, l let's talk about the characteristics of the stopcock. This one happens to, they, they, they can look a little differently, but this, it'll always say one direction is off. So I don't know if you can read that very well in the video, but it says off with an arrow pointing this direction. So this longer arm is the direction it's closed. So you'll have the manometer hooked up generally on the top here, and this will generally be open, uh, and that this means that it's open to the patient if you connect this to the spinal needle and then the manometer. So it's open in both those directions right now. But we could close it to the manometer or we could close it to the patient, okay? Generally, we'll have it closed to uh, the, the back open end because we don't want CSF just running out while we're measuring opening pressure. But we can use this then to turn it uh, like this, for example, so that it's open from manometer to this open end to collect the first part of the CSF that was originally uh, drawn up into or filled into the manometer. So I'll, I'll try to show that a little later on in the video, but that's the stopcock. Uh, for uh, handling the stopcock and the manometer, additionally, most lumbar puncture trays uh, contain this uh, extension piece um, so that you can connect it to the, the manometer and to the spinal needle so that it gives you a little bit more flexibility. But you can just connect stopcock with manometer directly to the back end of the, the spinal needle as well, just being careful not to push the needle or pull it at all while you're doing that. And I'll try to demonstrate that as, as we move forward with this video. Other things that are contained within a lumbar puncture tray here in this little trough area, um, generally a band-aid that can be used to place over the area once you are done with the procedure. Little information about lidocaine, so drug information there. And then stickers to be able to label your specimen. So before you, as the person who performed the procedure, before you send these vials off to the lab, you need to make sure that the, the vials are labeled uh, with the patient's identifying information. Uh, and generally, you know, it might include something like room number, or medical record number, uh, your name, uh, the provider that's performing the procedure, and uh, date and time of collection. So make sure that is done immediately once you're done obtaining everything so that it's done before it's sent off to the lab. If it's not labeled and the lab gets it without any uh, labels, then they're not going to be able to perform the procedure and your patient is unfortunately going to have to have a lumbar puncture performed again. So make sure you label everything correctly while it's in your presence. Okay. All right, so that's the contents of a standard lumbar puncture tray. All right, so let's review some important anatomy as well before we, we get into the lumbar puncture itself. Um, so notice here on our, our skeletal model, uh, the superior iliac crests here, so the patient's hip bones that you'd be able to palpate, uh, are at the level of the L4, generally spinous process. So palpate the patient's uh, iliac crests and in right at that same level we'd have l4 see if we spin this around where we've got sacrum this is l5 l4 l3 so our spinous process of l4 is at the line at the same height as the iliac crests and we're going to be performing the lumbar puncture at the l3 4 space or the l4 5 space that's the best safest place to be performing a lumbar puncture. The spinal cord itself, generally in most individuals, the conus medullaris is at about the L1 level. So by L1 or, or thereabout, the spinal cord has stopped and now it's just spinal nerves traveling down through that, that fecal sac. So now with a spinal needle, I wanna demonstrate, uh, show the, the, the idea here is that we're going to be inserting the needle between the spinous processes at that level and into the spinal canal there, the central canal. So either here at this L3-4 level or at the L4-5 level, okay? So we're going to notice how the needle is going to not be perfectly perpendicular to the patient's back, but is going to be directed a little bit in an upwards direction. Sometimes we say pointed to the patient's umbilicus that's about right here, okay? so a little bit of an upward direction so that it goes, follows the superior ridge of that spinous process. And notice if we uh, look, that's the, the main 
entrance point where we can go through the ligamentum flavum in this area and uh, into the central canal. I want to show this a little bit more on another spinal, excuse me, another skeletal model. Okay, on this miniature skeleton, uh, this is not a pediatric skeleton, it's just a miniature adult skeleton. Uh, you can see this again. So we've got our, at the iliac crest level, we've got L4, there's L5, and then L3. And so our needle is generally going to be passing between those, and as you can see, it enters into that central canal area where the, the fecal sac that contains the cauda equina and the CSF is right there in that central canal area, okay? So I wanna demonstrate a couple other things with this. We can, we can have our patient sitting in a seated position during this procedure. So I'm gonna move my skeleton around and put, put uh, this, this skeleton in a seated position. And if we are performing a lumbar puncture in a seated position, then it's important to know we cannot measure opening pressure or we, could, we can measure it, it's just not going to be an accurate measurement because gravity is pushing down from above. And so the more accurate way to measure opening pressure is with the patient on their side. But there's two ways to do a lumbar puncture, sitting or on their side. If we have them sitting, it's a good idea to put a pillow or something here in their lap, and then they're going to bend forward like this. Okay, they're gonna bend forward. As they bend forward, that's going to be opening up the spaces between the, the spinous processes here. So let me kind of try to demonstrate that here for you. So as they are bending forward, uh, the spinous processes are going to be opening up. So that's going to help with passing the needle in that area. So we, we do want our patient, whether they're in the seated position or lying on their side like this, same idea. They're gonna be lying on their side in kind of a fetal position curled like this around usually something like a pillow. And what that does is it opens up the spinous processes there in the lumbar spine, helping with the procedure. And again, it's in this lying on their side position that we would want to have the patient in that position to perform a lumbar puncture and measure opening pressure. All right, so we've got our patient sitting here and actually a patient's laying on, our si on, on his or her side, okay? So buttocks would be here, head in this direction. Um, right or left is okay, and, and I generally do it with the patient's head to my left. Uh, because I'm right-handed and I, I feel better control that direction. But if you're left-handed, maybe you feel better with the patient's head on your right. Uh, but get the patient situated. If we're measuring opening pressure, remember we're always going to have them lying on their side. Um, so that's gonna be the majority of the time you can perform this with them sitting forward. Um, but our patient here, the, the mannequin doesn't have iliac crest, but you'd palpate around feeling for spinous processes. So I'm feeling an L4 or an L5 spinous process here, and I can feel the space between those two spinous processes. So once we have the patient in position, and I, I generally like to put a chucks pad under them like this, um, then I'm gonna go ahead and put on sterile gloves. So these obviously aren't sterile gloves, but we're gonna pretend like they are. All right, so with the patient in position, I get my, my gloves on, my sterile gloves, now I can touch things in my lumbar puncture tray. One of those things, the first thing I wanna to touch now is my sponges. And I'm going to soak up that sponge into some provodyne iodine solution. And then in the area where I've palpated and I know that I'm going to be sticking my needle, I'm going to start in the center and make larger circles. And I generally am going to sterilize about a good six inch in diameter circle, six to eight inch area. And again, once I've used this once, it cannot go back on my lumbar tray where everything's sterile. So I generally like to have a garbage can or something nearby that I can just drop it in. Again, keeping my hands sterile. And I'm gonna do that with all three of the sponges. Same thing, starting in the middle, going out, letting that dry, and that sterilizes the skin in that area. Should have mentioned this earlier, but in addition to the sterile gloves, some providers like to take it to another level of sterility and wear an actual sterile gown and even a face mask during the procedure. Because there, there are bodily fluids, it's also a smart thing to have some form of eye protection as well. So some might wear goggles or some kind of glasses during the procedure. But the point is making sure that it's sterile and you're doing everything you can to keep this as a sterile procedure and not contaminate anything. So after you've got your, your iodine solution there in place, 
that's when we can use these these drapes or these towels that came in our sterile kit. So again, this is a sterile towel. One of them is a square towel and being careful to open this up without letting it touch anything so that you're not contaminated in anything. Open it up and get it laid out flat like this and then lie it below your patient here. Again, careful not to contaminate your gloves. Set it in position. Don't put it down and shift it around. Put it in exactly where you want it to be at first. And this can act as a nice little sterile field for you to sit and rest things if needed during the procedure. The other drape is a fenestrated drape, and meaning it has a hole in it, a circular hole. Um, they oftentimes come with these stickies that you can peel off that make it stick to the patient, and that's nice. But again, you're gonna open this up in a sterile fashion, not letting it contaminate anything or touch the patient. I may have let it touch the mannequin, don't do that. Open it up away from your patient so that it doesn't contamin get contaminated, and you're gonna bring it in nice and slowly and carefully so that circle is right over the area where you're going to be performing the lumbar puncture and stick it into place. And it might stick to that some of that iodine solution that is there on the patient's back. So right over that area, careful not to contaminate your gloves and now you have a sterile field to work with. Now at this point I should have my manometer is all set up, right? I've got the manometer set up with the extension piece on the top. So let's make sure we get that set up. Manometer is set up. Remember this is sterile. We've got our stopcock connected to the bottom of it and make your stopcock uh, generally closed to this back open, the back end here. And you've got this ready. Now again, keeping the sterile. So lying it only in a sterile position on your, on your tray over here on the side. So now before we actually stick our spinal needle into our patient, we need to use some anesthetic. So a local anesthetic, generally two to three cc's of lidocaine and uh, would have been already drawn up over here in our sterile field. And I'm going to remove the cap then, and we're going to inject this. And I'm going to, I can with my glove that's sterile, I can palpate again and feel and touch where those spinous processes are and remind myself of exactly where I'm going to be going. Sometimes you can even use your nail bed, to, your nail to cause a little indentation in the skin so you can see it again. And then I'm going to inject, uh, I'm going to insert my needle along that path that I know I'm going to be traveling with my spinal needle. I'm going to insert that there. I might aspirate a little bit to know that I didn't actually make it all the way into the fecal sac where there's CSF and that I'm not in a large vessel and then I'm going to administer a little bit of lidocaine as I slowly draw out, um, administering lidocaine in that same general track and vicinity where I'm going to be um, sticking the spinal needle. Now at the beginning of the procedure for, for compassion towards your patient, it's also wise before you even stick this lidocaine needle in like I did, start with a superficial wheel. Create a little wheel of lidocaine there in the area to numb the skin at that level, and then go ahead and go deeper with your needle and inject along that track where your spinal needle is going to be traveling. So providing some good anesthesia to this area. It is not a comfortable procedure. It's not horribly painful, but it's not pleasant either. Um, and some patients can experience more pain with it than others. So lidocaine is a, a great thing to uh, administer there before your spinal needle comes out. And then you're ready to use your needle. So let's talk about the different types of needles for just a second. So there are several types of lumbar puncture needles, but there are two main types. Okay, probably the most common one that you'll see is called a quinky needle. Okay, and the quinky needle is, uh, it's, it's very similar to the type of needle that is used for placing venipuncture, uh, for performing venipunctures or placing IVs. Okay, it's just a, a needle with the end that's been sheared off in an angle, and so the bevel is kind of an oval shape that faces upwards, and it's at the end of the very, very end of the needle. Okay, but then there's also a second type that's called a Whitaker needle, and a Whitaker needle is kind of like a pencil tip where it comes to the end like a pencil or a crayon and the hole in the needle is actually not right at the tip it's upwards it's a it's back from the tip a little bit on one side like you see here and so those are the two main the two most common types that you'll see and really probably the more common one that you'll see in the emergency room setting is this quinky needle now I've gone ahead and removed the fenestrated drape just for the sake of filming so that it's not in the way of the, the camera here, but um, you would keep that in place, obviously. So the needle that I actually am going to be using today is a quinky needle. OK, 
okay so it's got that flat bevel i don't know how well you can see it here in the in the video but a uh, flat uh, sharp pointed bevel there and notice the stylet then fills the end of that bevel and as you withdraw the stylet it opens the end of the bevel okay so remember you're always going to have your stylet fully in place as you are advancing or withdrawing the needle. Now, a little thing that I want to show you here with the, the spinal needles, some of them are different depending on the manufacturer, but they all have, see the little, uh, the little ridge there, okay, in the yellow, the little ridge there, that inserts into the little notch in the, the clear part of this hub. And so it can't be fully in place if it's backwards. Notice it's not locked in place there, it's wiggly. And so if, if I have my stylet in backwards or the wrong direction, it's not blocking that hole completely. And so I need to spin it around and have it the right direction with that little ridge inside the notch and then it blocks the, uh, the, the bevel. Okay, so making sure that you've got the, the stylet in the right position and all the way in is important. Um, and as you're, uh, as you're advancing your needle, some other things that we need to talk about, uh, especially with the quinky uh, needle here, you want to have your bevel, with, when your patient is lying on their side like this, you want to have the bevel facing upwards, okay? Or if they're on their side, you'd have the bevel facing their hip. Okay, either right or left. So the, the main idea here is that you want your bevel facing the patient's hip bone upwards in the case when they're lying on their side. The main reason for that is the, the, the fibers of the dura actually run longitudinally up and down the dura. And so I generally, and, and, and if you've got your needle facing towards the ceiling when they're lying down, the bevel up, then it's going to be kind of piercing through the fibers of the dura rather than if your bevel was, your cutting needle bevel was to the side, it's more likely to cause a cutting of those longitudinal fibers and it increases the chance or the likelihood that the patient's going to have a spinal leak or a spinal headache as a complication after this procedure. Okay, so making sure that your bevel is always pointed in the direction of a hip bone. If they're, again, if they're sitting up, it's going to be facing right or left. If they're lying on their side like this, like we're going to measure opening pressure, then your bevel needs to be facing upwards. Okay. Um, it's kind of like that idea of, you know, if you've got a beaded curtain, you walk through a beaded curtain, you separate them like this. We're, we're opening the beaded curtain or the longitudinal fibers of the dura like this, and the hope is after we pull that needle out, they just kind of close and the risk of a spinal headache de is, is decreased. All right, so once we make sure that we have everything in place, we've got our fenestrated drape on, we've got our, our uh, manometer all set up and ready, then we're, we've got all our vials open and standing in order of one, two, three, four, then we're ready to go. And at this point, um, I like to stabilize my needle a little bit by holding it back here sometimes, um, just to, to provide me a little bit more stability as I'm in, inserting the needle. But again, bevel upwards in this case, uh, using your sterile gloves and your thumb, you can again palpate around, make sure you know, okay, there's my, you know, my, there's my L4-5 inner space, and we want to insert the needle right there at midline okay and we want to direct our needle not perfectly perpendicular with the patient's back but pointed a little bit upwards towards a little bit what we sometimes call cephalad or towards the head um, towards the umbilicus is what some people say because the umbilicus is a, a little higher uh, than than this l45 level but we're going to direct it upwards a little bit rather than straight perpendicular into the patient's uh, body, okay? And we want to make sure that uh, horizontally we are parallel with the floor. We're not going down, we're not going up. So perfectly parallel with the floor and a little bit towards the patient's head. We're going to advance between those spinous processes. And as you get into the ligamentum flavum there, the ligamentum flavum is pretty tough actually. So you're going to be feeling a little bit of resistance as it travels through that area. Now, if you feel your needle hit bone, it's going to feel a little bit like a grinding type uh, sensation and uh, you'll feel that with the needle. What you can do is just get an idea of, what I like to do is get an idea of where that bone is. Is the bone below my needle? Is it above my needle? Okay, so am I, on the, am I touching the bottom part of the spinous process 
the L3 sinus process or the L4 sinus process, the top of that. And get, once I get an idea of where it is, then I'm gonna back up just a little bit and then redirect so that I can follow that bone along and advance a little further. So as we've repositioned and now we're advancing a little bit further, hopefully we're not hitting bone again. We might be pushing through some rather tough tissue. If you feel like, man, I feel like I'm, I'm deep enough here. I feel like I should be there. You may not have felt any kind of a pop. You can stop advancing the needle and withdraw the stylet. You have to withdraw the stylet all the way, otherwise CSF can't flow. Wait for just a second. If nothing comes, place your stylet back in. Make sure it's in full uh, fully locked position there, and then go ahead and advance your needle a little bit more. Sometimes you might feel your needle go through the dura with a little bit of a pop. I'll tell you from personal experience, I think it's about 50-50 that I feel the needle penetrate the dura, but uh, once you feel like you're, you're possibly there, you did feel that little bit of a pop sensation again, stop, withdraw, give it a second, see if you have any CSF, so once your stylet's back in position again, you're gonna maybe advance a little bit further and there I think I maybe just felt it pop a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop. I think I might be there. I'm gonna withdraw the needle and there we go. We've got CSF. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug that back up with the stylet so the CSF's not running. And next what I need to do is measure my opening pressure. Okay, and so we're gonna use the manometer here. Now you can just connect the manometer here straight into the needle once the stylet is out, okay? And then the, the, the manometer just, you need to hold it and stabilize it. And that's why I sometimes like to have a, an assistant here that can hold the top of it to help stabilize that, okay? Uh, and then you're gonna watch the CSF rise. So I wanna have the, mono, the stop cock off to this area right here and uh, open to the patient and to the manometer. Um, there also is an option that you can use the flexible cord here that comes with with your uh, kit. Uh, the way you could do that is hook it up here and then somebody holding onto the manometer for you. I'm gonna set it down since I don't have any else, anybody else with me right now. And then you can connect this. And the, the, the idea with the, the flexible tubing is it just gives you a little bit more leeway. Um, but if you do use the tubing, make sure that when you're measuring pressure that the stopcock is at the same vertical level with the needle. Otherwise, you're going to get a artificially elevated or uh, decreased opening pressure. It needs to be right there at the same level as the needle. So I'll sometimes use the flexible tubing, other times I won't. So it just depends. So we're going to go ahead and hook this up now. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that stylet and I want to act quickly here so I can get the true opening pressure. Remove the stylet, stabilize the needle as I connect the stopcock and notice you start to see the CSF rise. So we're gonna let that rise and rise and rise, and it's gonna go out of the view of the video here, but uh, the it's gonna stop, it's actually stopping at about 12, okay? So generally five to 20 centimeters of water, sometimes uh, different resources might say uh, 10 to 20, but generally in that ballpark is the, the, the normal value. So this is where it's nice to have uh, somebody else holding the top of your manometer for you, so that you can then use one hand to continue to stabilize this, this uh, needle that's in the patient's back and the manometer. And then with your other hand, bring your first vial in to the, the, to the area and underneath that spot. Now you're going to open this up, close it to the patient and open it to the manometer and the tube so that you collect that first bit of fluid that came from the patient's spine into that first vial, so you don't waste it. So now, very carefully, I'm going to disconnect the manometer without moving the needle. So disconnect the manometer, set it off to the side, and again, start collecting my CSF. It's important that we collect CSF passively, meaning we just let go and let it drip in one drip at a time okay, in order to collect the CSF. Now we're going to, it's now the, the mannequin here is losing a little bit of pressure, um, but your patient hopefully wouldn't lose pressure that quickly, uh, but you're gonna collect it passively, meaning uh, you're never going to aspirate outside of that needle. That can create a negative pressure within the spinal column that just increases the risk of herniation up in the cranium. So we're gonna let it passively drip and we're gonna collect one to two cc's in each of our vials until our and, and we're going to fill them in order, right? One, two, three, four. Okay. 
Now, if your CSF ever stops flowing, like you're, maybe you're on vial number two, for example, and it's not dripping anymore, then what? Well, what you could do, um, if that was the case, you can simply turn your spinal needle a little bit, okay? And what that, and that might increase the, the flow coming out of that, uh, the drip rate again. The idea is if you're turning your needle, you're moving, you're turning the bevel that's there in the spinal column, um, because sometimes those spinal nerves can float around and, and maybe occlude the end of the needle. So just by simply turning it, it might open it back up again. Okay, so uh, fill your vials, one to two cc's in each vial, um, and then once you're done, you're gonna place your stylet back into its normal position, and again, you want to reposition it with that ridge mark up because that ridge mark corresponds with the open or the, the face of the bevel so that our bevel is up, ridge up, bevel up, and then we're going to go ahead and withdraw our needle, always with the stylet in its position. So we're going to remove that needle and we're going to use some, if there's a little bit of blood or, or leakage there, we can use a bit of sterile gauze to uh, put a apply a little bit of pressure there. And then our lumbar puncture tray does come with a band-aid that you'd place a sterile band-aid in the spot and uh, over the, over the area. So, so that is how you perform a lumbar puncture and measure opening pressure. All right, I hope you found this video to be helpful and educational. Don't forget to hit subscribe, give it a thumbs up, comment down in the bottom. Thank you for watching.